Now the bad guys have control of the laptop inside of the refinery's IT network. Hello and welcome to Waterfalls Industrial Security Institute. I'm Andrew Ginter with Waterfall Security Solutions and we are working our way through the top 20 cyber attacks on industrial control systems. In this series of videos, we are using the top 20 attacks to compare the strength of two different security postures. One program is vintage 2013 advice, very software based. One of each, there's intrusion detection, there's antivirus. This site is completely up to date. The other one is that same software-based program coupled with one piece of more modern advice, which is replacing the ITOT firewall with an ITOT unidirectional security gateway. Today's attack scenario is a sophisticated commodity market manipulation attack. The attack in video number eight, you know, the same qualification applies here. It assumes the target is a facility that produces a valuable commodity. Let's uh, imagine that our target is a refinery that is producing diesel fuel, gasoline, and jet fuel, all of which have a local commodities market. And so there tends to be a local spot market on the local stock market to speculate on the price of the commodity of gasoline or diesel fuel. So what we're assuming is that an organized crime syndicate has targeted the commodities market. And it's going to achieve an end in the commodities market by compromising the refinery. And, you know, if you thought last video's attack was sophisticated, well, they're up on the ante here. We're predicating that this organized crime syndicate has written their own rat, their own remote access trojan. Instead of downloading one and tweaking it a little and recompiling it and hoping that it escapes the antivirus vendors, these people have said nuts to that and they've written their own. That's not like nothing else out there. And so, of course, there's no antivirus signatures for it because no antivirus engine has ever seen it. It's never been deployed. They deploy it at one target, not the refinery. They deploy it at a services provider. So they've scanned the, uh, the internet, they've scanned the news releases, and they've figured out who is boasting about being a provider of services to the refinery. And refineries tend to have a lot of contractors involved. So it's not that hard to find a services provider. They pick the least well-defended provider and they target that provider. How do they get in? Again, they exploit known vulnerabilities in internet-facing services at the provider. Maybe the web server, maybe something else. They get a foothold in the provider with this remote access Trojan. The Trojan immediately calls out to a command and control center and they have remote control of the computer that's been compromised with the Trojan. They use standard attack patterns. They look for password hashes. They look for passwords. They look for credentials. They steal credentials. They escalate privilege. They move laterally through the network and they find the laptops of engineers or technicians who are authorized to visit the plant, and they infect the laptops with a copy of the rat. Now, when these trusted engineers physically carry their laptop to the site, they're carrying the attack past security. They're carrying it past the firewall. They're carrying it into the target. They connect the laptop to the IT network in the target to do some work, and the rat, every time it connects to a network, phones home to the command and control center. Computers on the IT network are allowed to communicate with the internet. So the rat can, from this laptop, communicate out to the internet. Now the bad guys have control of the laptop inside of the refinery's IT network. They operate the rat remotely, they look around, they find targets inside the IT network, and they compromise those targets with copies of the rat. Now they've got a foothold in the IT network. The contractor can leave and these bad guys are still operating their remote access Trojans through the corporate firewall. And, you know, that communication, they've been very careful about. Instead of a, a, you know, a conventional encrypted communication, you know, high volume, remote desktop, this kind of thing, these, these people are playing low and slow. The rat appears to connect to a legitimate website. Um, it's using low volume communications, command line communications, not visual stuff with remote desktop style look and feel. It's very low volume and they've stegographically encoded this, you know, the commands and responses in legitimate seeming HTML sequences to the compromised website. So they're flying under the radar. 
with a foothold on the IT network, they spread around a bit and they wait until their technician or one of these trusted engineers comes through security again and connects the laptop to the industrial network. Now, on the industrial network, they've changed the programming or they've changed the configuration of the RAT. Instead of trying to call out to the internet, which won't work from the industrial network, 2013 best practice says there's no connection from the industrial network out to the internet. They've changed the RAT so that when it's connected to a network, it tries to connect to one of the compromised IT machines. Generally speaking, you can communicate from an industrial network out to a DMZ, out to other networks inside the same enterprise, the same target. And so if they've planted enough of these rats around, low volume, low profile rats, they're going to find one of them when this laptop starts automatically looking around trying to connect to these rats. When it connects to one of these rats, the rat can daisy chain the communications out to the internet. And now the bad guys have control of a rat on the industrial network indirectly through one or more rats that they've planted on the IT network. Again, they operate the rat while the laptop is connected to the industrial network. They find other machines, they install the rat on those machines. Now the rat is being daisy chained and they have remote access into the industrial network, all flying under the radar. Now they work their will. They find the PLC, they find the HMI configurations, they analyze it all, they have the deep engineering knowledge, they cause a malfunction in two or three refineries in a small geography at the same time. Those refineries go down unexpectedly for 10 or 15 days in the middle of high season for the commodity. The prices of the commodity on the spot market spike and these people make a lot of money. And you know they've been speculating on the stock market a little bit, a little bit for a long time. So the fact that they make a lot of money when the market changes suddenly and unexpectedly is not suspicious. The damaged equipment is repaired. When they've damaged the equipment, what they do is immediately erase all trace of their presence, all of the rats, all the logs, everything they can, they can get hold of, you know, the, the compromised PLC program, they, they change back to what it's supposed to be. So that any investigation says, looks like a random failure, this piece of equipment, go chew out the vendor. And they can do the whole thing again, a year later or six months later, whenever, again, there's a normal spike in demand for the commodity. So in terms of sophistication, this is a very sophisticated attack. They've invested in writing their own state of the practice rat. They have invested in the engineering knowledge to understand the physical process, to understand what kind of equipment they can cause to fail, to understand how that equipment's programmed. They have a lot of expertise they've purchased and applied to this process of repeatedly making millions of dollars on a spot market. In terms of consequences for the business, well, the business goes down every few months with failures that they just can't figure out. They're chewing out the vendor. This could go on for years. Every time this happens, well, you know, the average refinery makes something like 30, 40, 50 million dollars a day. If you're down for 10 days, that's a big hit. And so this is a very expensive uh, kind of attack for the enterprise being targeted, not to mention, you know, for the investors who are being targeted as well and being scammed out of millions of dollars. How do our two defensive postures hold up against this class of attack? Well, this attack was designed to defeat a state of the practice 2013 vintage security posture. The rat has only been deployed at the refinery and at the refinery's vendor. Um, and so no antivirus vendor has seen thousands of copies of it on the internet. No antivirus vendor has produced a signature for it. You know, we're flying blind with respect to the antivirus vendors. The rat does not exploit known vulnerabilities. It's exploiting permissions, it's harvesting credentials. And so the security update program doesn't really help us. Intrusion detection. This rat is using stegographically encrypted, um, very silent, very low volume communications. It's daisy chaining communications out to the internet. In a sense, it's doing nothing suspicious. There's, there's very little here that an intrusion detection system can alarm on. At best, you're going to get some kind of low priority alarms and, you know, it's catch as catch can. Sometimes you investigate these things, sometimes you let them go because there's bigger fires burning on the IT network. Ransomware might be loose. Who knows? Are you going to distract yourself from high priority investigations for a bunch of low priority alarms? Maybe.
but none of this is reliable. This 2013 vintage, uh, you know, defensive posture is not reliably catching this class of attack. The unidirectional stuff does reliably defeat this class of attack. How? Well, the attackers can still get their rat on the IT network, but once the rat comes into the industrial network and tries to call out to the IT network so that it can daisy chain out to the internet, well, that won't work. Unidirectional gateways are not routers. They don't forward network traffic. They're not firewalls. You know, people imagine unidirectional gateways are unidirectional firewalls. They're not. They do something different. They make copies of whatever servers you need to serve the data out to the IT network. The gateways give you access to the data without giving you access to the systems that produce the data. This is the difference between a firewall and a gateway. The attack stegographically encoded blah 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 cannot get out through the gateway and even if it could there's no commands that could come back to find your way around and find the PLC and figure out how to reprogram it. None of that can happen. None of that discovery process can happen through a unidirectional gateway because remote commands cannot get into the industrial network. The gateway physically is unable to communicate that, that attack information. So the unidirectional gateway does reliably defeat this class of very sophisticated attack. So once again, we're looking at our scorecard. We can see a difference here. There's a difference building up, a significant difference between the strength of the two security postures. We'll see how this evolves over time. That's what I had for you this time. A reminder, don't forget that this whole series of videos is based on a white paper by the same name, the top 20 cyber attacks on industrial control systems. It's on the Waterfall website if you want to download a copy. And uh, that's what I had for you. Thank you for watching. And you did watch to the end, so please give us a like and subscribe. Thanks so much.